Hello, welcome to my talk. My name is Bartosz Kolaszewski. I'm with the Qualcomm landing team at Linaro. I've been uh, doing Linux development for 15 years and using it for close to 20. I maintain the GPIO subsystem and uh, its user space counterpart. And I have, an, I have a personal interest in uh, complex software architecture, uh, like uh, the, what the kernel represents. And I, I would say that I'm a bit of a jack of all trades, which is great because it allows me to not be very good at anything in particular. <laughs> This is going to be the fourth episode in the Netflix mini-series about, uh, about <laughs> object lifetime in uh, the Linux kernel. So the first talk was a year ago at Plumbers by Laurent Pancha. And uh, then my response at FASDEM and finally uh, Wolfram's last talk at uh, ELC in Prague. I didn't want to spend too much time on uh, introductions, but some, some summaries in order. So. DevRes, the device uh, management syst system, has been blamed for a long time for uh, certain memory issues used after free bugs. Uh, but I'm, uh, upon some further investigation, it turned out that it's not really DevRes. It's mostly the fact that struct device, um, no, I'm sorry, that drivers embed the reference counted struct device within private data that is freed when the driver is detached. And uh, subsystems uh, either ignore it and explode when that happens, or uh, go to uh, go, go on and try to implement the wildest uh, workarounds, just not to uh, crash. And uh, when, when the drivers detach, when, the, when when there are references still active to, to the embedded struct device, and this problem is uh, very old. It predates Git, actually. And that some, there are some comments that are uh, 18 years old uh, that, that mention this issue, so it's, it's not a new one. And also feel free to, uh, to, 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 uh, to chime in whenever you, you have a, let's make it a discussion. And the agenda for today, it was supposed to, I was supposed to be talking about solutions exclusively, but the more, the more I experimented, the more I dug deeper, it turned out that the, 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 there are actually more problems than initially than what we found out initially. So the agenda is quite simple. Uh, we're going to discuss another set of issues. And then uh, I'm going to use the, the certain terms quite freely. So I, I, I want to clarify what I mean when I when I say a resource, I don't, I don't mean struct resource as, as understood in, in, in kernel device drivers. I, what I mean is a software representation of uh, any hardware asset, so a regulator or a GPIO or a clock. And when I say resource handle, that means the software structure, the structure data that it represents it, be it a struct, some opaque structure or uh, an integer, like uh, for interrupts. And then when we speak about providers and consumers, so a, a provider will be a device bound to a driver that exports, exposes certain resources to users. And then the consumer is the driver that gets it and gets it assigned uh, via some some way and, and, and then gets it and then is able to use it. And uh, the, finally, the kernel subsystem. So when, when I say kernel su driver subsystems, I mean a, any, any of the libraries that provide abstraction layers and group, uh, allow to group drivers logically or physically. So we have, uh, let's say, logical uh, abstraction layers like NVMem and uh, hardware abstraction layers like uh, GPIO. And we have subsystems, often, often drivers will, especially provider drivers will often go through multiple layers of abstraction uh, without one knowing about the other. And also we have, uh, it seems that a lot of subsystems have been simply copied and pasted and, and reworked to, to create new ones. Um, and they don't get as much care, I suppose, as uh, the core kernel components, uh, because there are so many driver subsystems. And with that, with that out of the way, I would like to start with a uh, thought experiment. So let's, and then it's going to be a quiz. So let's consider this. We have a resource provider, which uh, is just a, just a driver in the kernel, and we have a subsystem to which that resource provider subscribes, and it exposes a device to user space. So now we have a process that uh, shows up and it opens the device file. It gets a file descriptor and in the kernel we create the corresponding struct file. Uh, and the resource provider now exposes a, the resource handle. But this uh, resource ha this resource exists on a uh, detachable bus. So we have, uh, we have it on a, on a USB bus. And oh no, what happens? So now the resource is gone. USB was unplugged. 
what should we do with this user space process? So should we kill it, uh, send it a signal and then and just terminate the process? Or should we make the process subscribe for some uh, secondary uh, channel? I, I'm, I'm making this up on bind FD. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just making, uh, making stuff up, uh, but the process opens the, the device file and also subscribes for some notification mechanism so that it will be informed when the, when the resource is down. Or should the process just get see an error the next time it calls into the kernel using uh, a syscall? So, which one? Well, see, I was I was so certain that this is going to be the answer that I put a smiley face uh, in my slides. <laughs> so now uh, a second question. So this time we're in the kernel entirely. We have a driver and a provider, and the driver calls get foo in. Exchange it gets a structure, which is the resource handle for the resource. And now the driver can call into the provider API uh, using the handle. But again, the provider is now gone. So the driver now calls the same function. What should happen? Or the driver will be detached and it will put the resource. What should happen even more? So the the answers are analogous to uh, to what we discussed with the with the with the process so option a uh, an analogy to killing the process would be forcing the consumer driver to unbind when the provider is being unbound we could do that somehow we could uh, whenever the, the provider is being detached we can use the bus remove callback to uh, detach all the resource consumers and force their remove callbacks to be called, where upon the foo put function would be called, the resources of the provider would be freed, and the provider can proceed with being detached. Or B, uh, whenever we get the resource, we force the consumer to subscribe to some notification channel to get informed whenever the provider is gone. Or C, consumer will call on the next API call to the provider will simply return an error. So which one? I, <laughs> I, I, I would. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, I, I think C is the, the most sane thing to do. However, let's now, where, where, where am I getting with it? So real life example. This time, uh, nothing, nothing abstract, just a real name. So CP21. 12 is a GPIO and I2C expander on, on, a, on a USB stick. We plug it in. It comes up. Uh, GPIO lib exposes the character device, GPIO, GPIO character device to user space. We have uh, a user space tool for monitoring interrupts on GPIOs that uh, comes up and it calls an IOCTL getting, uh, requesting the, the interrupt. Um, so GPIO lib will, will go to the, to the GPIO driver for, from, from the CP2112 hit driver, it will request the, the interrupt. So we we're back in space, we, we kill GPI on and yeah, and uh, we, we kill GPI one, so it will call free ERC because it's like the, the, the kernel side uh, representation of, of, uh, of the context of GPI one will call free interrupt, and we're going to see fireworks in DMSG. So the splat that you're going to see is going to come from uh, ProcFS because we're going to be removing, uh, we're going to be leaking ProcFS files uh, from the interrupt uh, subsystem because we have destroyed all the mappings, interrupt mappings. We have, this, we are freeing, we, we have already freed the domain when, 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 the, when the USB was unplugged, but there are still references to those interrupts and now we're freeing them and we're leaking resource. So nothing crashes, but there are, there are resource leaks in the kernel. Um, so you would think that we're still you know, within the users, within the, within the GPIO uh, subsystem and we could make something up to notify the context created for, for the user space tool to free that interrupt when that domain is being, uh, this, when that interrupt domain is being free. And yes, we could, but the problem is actually generic because if we consider any driver that gets an interrupt from wherever, in device three, for instance, and then it requests it, and then that provider, that interrupt uh, controller 
is unbound for whatever reason, then that driver has no, like it, it, it doesn't have to be in the same subsystem. It can be something completely else. We'll never know that this interrupt provider is gone. And this is not a problem that is specific to interrupts. I'm just, I've, I've just encountered that issue when, when, uh, when experimenting. But try to use Ethernet files. Uh, you, you want to? Yeah, just, just a question. So yeah? this, you, what you're saying is this is completely independent of the problem that interrupts are identified by integers, not pointers to a structure. No, this is irrelevant. This, okay. like, whether this, the whether the handle is an integer or struct, uh, opaque struct, that a pointer, that, 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 that doesn't matter. Uh, I think we're still talking about kind of two orthogonal problems in this specific case, uh, and in general, uh, which one is the problem that you are getting at is needing potentially some form of notification to know that something you rely on is gone before you do an API call, or in the case of interrupt, because you never actually do any API call, you just expect something to happen, it never will. And the specific problem we have there where uh, the freeing of interrupt after the fact is causing splat, it shouldn't, that's bugs. Like, uh, we should be able to hold on to a partial remnant of a resource whose backend is gone. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm... And, 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 and those are kind of different problems, and they both need to be addressed, but. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. Uh, the thing is that, uh, so interrupts, uh, because they're using integers, as you said, they have a lookup uh, radix tree or something, some, some kind of uh, mechanism to, to look up the interrupts. So when they are not found, then resources are leaked, but nothing crashes because they are not found. Um, on the other hand, if on the other hand, if you try to uh, use a file from an Ethernet driver, and that file is gone for whatever reason, it can be gone because it can be on the same on, on a different MDI, MDIO bus than the Ethernet uh, controller. Um, then everything will crash and burn because the, the, it uses a pointer and, and you're there referencing it, uh, and there's nothing behind it. So yeah, this is sorry. Yes, and I'm. I'm 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 definitely getting there. So what is is, is <laughs> what, what is going on? <coughs> um, yeah. So yeah, go on. The first one shouldn't be true at least anymore with uh, Which DD based one? devices. Consumers of resources are not notified when the providers of these resources are unbound. Shouldn't they? They are no. I mean they're they're forcefully unbound. Is no. that not sufficient? There is no forcing of, uh, uh, there is no forced unbind of, of the consumers. At least in DT-based systems, there should be. No. I'm like 99% sure. You have like device links created. Only where... only ch child-parent relationship will force any unbinding, but not... No, no. Uh... Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Any, so from my door... any, any provider goes away, the driver never get, gets notified. Right? Clocks, sorry, what? resets. Who's speaking? For any... Prov any provider disappears on you, no, no API notifies you, the consumer. Yes, no, no, no. there is no, no such thing, okay. yeah. So there are device Blocks links. has the same problem, like resets, that. everything. And uh, so that's... maybe let, let me go through uh, a couple more slides uh, because I'm, I'm actually going to describe the, the, the I, I have a slide uh, for, for, for a discussion in, in, in a few uh, slides coming up. So uh, let, let me just uh, get through, through the following ones. Um, yeah, so so the, the thing as, as as discussed, there is no way of children of sorry children of consumers getting informed by the providers being gone. And uh, in GPIO, it, it's it's funny because GPIO handles that. Uh, I noticed that it, it's fine. I didn't design it, but when I uh, when when, I, when I'm looking at what GPIO does, and and it's the same for regulators, for instance, that there is a certain pattern that it follows. So when you have a GPIO device driver, it implements the GPIO chip structure with which holds all the callbacks, basically the implementation and some metadata for the GPIO chip. But what the GPIO lib does is it wraps it in a reference counted GPIO device struct. This is not something that the GPIO driver touches. This is provided by the subsystem and it's reference counted as uh, you suggested. So uh, the GPIO chip is owned by the provider, but the GPIO device is controlled by the library. And what's happen what, what happens, well, it's, it's reference counted, and then what happens when the GPIO consumer gets the GPIO, it gets a descriptor, which is an opaque structure, and this structure references GPIO device. So as long as there are references 
still being held to GPIO device, it's guaranteed to stay alive. So that when the provider of the GPIO is gone, the, the wrapper around it is still alive. And then whenever the consumer will call into GPIO lib, it will, well, I would love it if, if, it's, if it's so an error, but actually it's gonna see zero and we're gonna emit an error. I'm, I'm working on it, but because you, GPIOs are so ubiquitous in the kernel, it's hard to modify anything without breaking a hundred users or so. Um, so GPIO lib handles that barely, it still needs work. So there's no synchronization, for instance. Um, the, 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 the locking that is in place actually gets everything wrong. And uh, I'm, I'm, I've, I've been doing that for the last three, three months and I'm, 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 I know that it's gonna take uh, probably a, a year or so to fix it entirely, but, uh, but yeah, the work is in progress. So what is the problem? We have these abstraction layers but one abstraction layer not doesn't know that it's you know built on top of seven other abstraction layers so an example is that you have an nvmem but this nvmem actually uh, talks to uh, actually represents a, an eprom driver but that driver uses regmap and regmap goes into i2c and i2c goes uh, it's actually an adapter on a hid device and uh, you go through the hid layer and then go you, you go through the usb layer and the, the top four layers in this example don't even know that they can be detached. Um, they, they, they have no idea. So that you probably know Wolfram that when you uh, have a reference to like when you have when you're using a G, an I2C device, you you will unplug that uh, USB device for as long as you're going to be users. You're going to block on the completion and uh, you're not going to crash, but you're going to get stuck. So. What I'm thinking would make sense is to completely change uh, the, the philosophy. So don't think that the resources that you get as a consumer are something that you control. You weakly reference it. And, I, and when I say a weak reference is what, what I mean and what, what we understand in software developers on software development as uh, a reference that in order, which in order to be used has to be first converted into a strong reference. Um, so when you have, like, if you have virtual memory, you know that when you came malloc it and it will not go away, your virtual memory will, will stay there. So you control it and you have to K free it. But when you do foo get, and when, where foo is a kernel ref, uh, kernel resource, then you don't really control it. You just weakly reference it. And then you will strongly reference it for the duration of any. can go from under you at any point. And the provider API should be able to handle it. So now the proposition for a common model for resource providers, and this is close to what GPIO or regulators are doing, but many subsystems are not doing it and, and, and are doing a completely uh, different thing. So you have your provider, which is the driver, the implementation of the resource provider. You have your library, uh, the subsystem, which provides a common interface to consumers and you have your consumers. So the provider should create and own the implementation of that resource, but the library should create and own a ref reference counted wrapper around that implementation. So now this, uh, the, the implementation is removed when the driver is, the provider driver is detached, but the wrapper stays alive for as long as there are references to it. And now, the resource provides the resource handle, as explained before, which references, increases the reference count on that wrapper, and the ref resource consumer just holds that resource handle, which is the interface to the provider's API and allows to access it. So then whenever the actual provider is gone because it's on a USB stick and it's been unplugged, the reference counted wrapper stays alive, and when you call a sorry when you call a provider api function you will simply see an error because it's the the you will see no dev because the the actual provider is gone so now even the subsystems that get the previous part right which have this reference content wrapper they provide no synchronization um, I'm, I'm talking about uh, gpio regulators so uh, despite the fact that the resource implementation can be gone at any point, including when you are in the middle of an API call, they, they don't uh, synchronize it. So my idea for that would be simply to use SRCU. 
because it doesn't limit you in, in terms of what logs you can, you can use inside your provider API. And so that whenever your consumer makes the call to the provider, you enter the SRCU critical section. And then you see, okay, now is this implementation pointer, which is now protected with RCU, still not, not null? Okay, if it's not, then you can, you can do whatever the API does. If not, you return an appropriate error. And then when you're done, you unlock the SRCU, you exit your critical section. And when the resource provider is going down, then it's a, just a matter of assigning the pointer to the, the SRC protected pointer and synchronizing it. Does this make sense? Yeah. Okay. So device links are created, at least on DT based systems, device links are created between consumers and suppliers. When the supplier is unbound, we force unbind the consumer before we unbind the supplier. It's a terrible idea. But it at least it doesn't have this bug, right? It's a terrible idea anyway. It is terrible. You know, right. not it, like. You can have a loop on a dependency. This is what I want to say. Like a driver may remain functional even though one of the resources is gone. And then uh, it's, it's, it's like killing the process that opened the file and that file is uh, on, a, on, a, on a USB stick and you unplug the USB stick, then you kill the process because the, the file is gone. Well, it's not. Uh, so it's, it's, it's quite a terrible idea. So let's say, theoretically, let's say you notify that your provider is gone. What would you want to do in that instance as a driver? Return an error, just like, like this, this slide. So you check if it's still alive. And if it's not alive, you return an error. Eno dev, the driver sees Eno dev and uh, it does whatever it needs to do. I mean, and if we end up creating some generic boilerplate for subsystems to use around that, we can also add an optional callback to notify for things that don't have regular API calls, such as interrupts. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, you want to let the consuming driver decide what its policy is if its provider has gone, because this is fundamentally a policy decision by the consumer. Don't want to revoke. Huh? Don't want to revoke. Yeah, so if you... <coughs> yeah, so if all you want is a notification when one of your suppliers is gone with an indication of who the supplier is, that's super easy to do. We can do that today. Would that help you make things easier and better? At least on DT-based systems. But yeah, this is what I want to say. This is a generic problem. The, like if if you rely on on a DT-specific mechanism for device yeah, links, no, it's this, a... is, this is this is good. This is we didn't when we came up with like the original reference counting objects and K objects and stuff. We didn't really have SRCU. We couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And we were we thought we'd be smart and just pass around and handle this stuff. But my question is, you talk about a handle. Is a handle the pointer or is it just an opaque type like a handle? It doesn't matter. It can be an integer like for interrupts or it okay. can be right. a, so yeah. just just a handle. It's, okay. uh, it well, doesn't matter what it is. We're doing what Windows does, right? <laughs> so, you know, Which if, you, no, if, you, mean, if your handle is an okay. integer, you can imagine that you have a lookup table and internally the provider will, like the subsystem library will, will get some kind of a reference uh, counted object or oh. So I think it's very good because we have a really hard problem of abstractions leaking out of the core or whatever, because we have C, we can poke mm. into structures wherever we want. If you don't even have access to that and we just have a handle and you have to do all operations. I, I don't like handles because the lookup uh, that you do, it's an operation that is completely unneeded. Well, all you need is an opaque pointer. Yeah, it being an opaque pointer is great. I'm okay with that too, but I'm just saying that's good. We want this. Mm. Yeah, no, I like this. This is good. It'll solve, no, but that'll solve a lot of the abstractions we have, problems we have, and it'll make Rust easier. The opaque what? It'll, 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 this will make the interfaces with Rust, because this is going to be our biggest problem with actually running a driver in Rust, because our resources and our management mm -hmm. of objects are totally independent of what they want to do. Right. And we need to rewrite it. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah. yeah. Then we can bake into that whatever Rust needs, and no, no, that's excellent. That sounds that sounds really good. Yeah. So so the another way of framing this, it sounds to me when I step back, you're you're asking for accessor functions basically to access the reference that you have, right? Kind of. No, 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 no. no. What I'm saying is just that first first of all, um, I had Greg, you were CC'd on my discussion with Thomas Gleixner, and uh, he was not. Uh, on the same page with, as, 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 as I was in terms of uh, how interrupt, the interrupt subsystem should handle this situation. Um, 
<laughs> it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a euphemism, actually, but... Um, so <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm agreeing with you, but Thomas was right, and we shouldn't have been accessing those things at that point in time anyway. But if you do this, we have the fact that we know the object's gone and we're okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're, I'm, I'm getting to a, like, let, let's, let's find a solution and agree that this is the right one for handling provider consumer relationships where providers can like first, first thing is providers can go away or can be detached. The provider drivers can be detached at any, any, at any point and consumers must handle it or rather not even consumers, but the libraries, the subsystems must have a common way of handling that. Yeah, I think what Bartos really suggests is this wrapper, uh, 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 this wrapper which is uh, maintained by the subsystem. The, yes, the yes. API itself can be anything. How do you access this handle or what it does? But the key thing, which also, which is important for the subsystems, that the drivers implement something, and the subsystem puts a wrapper around it, and it too controls the lifetime yeah. of this wrapper. This is all we're talking about here. Yeah, so that the, everything when, when else the, when is the, a detail. When the provider driver goes down, the subsystem still maintains a shell around it as an, a safe interface that will not crash and burn whenever the consumer... Yeah, can, can you throw the mic to Greg? Whenever the consumer uh, accesses a resource that is already gone. Yeah, I mean, think of a USB device. The core created it, the driver, it's handed off to the driver and it can do some things sending data across the socket, but if it disappears, the driver still wants to be able to, right. it's going to take a while before things clean up. And that's, mm -hmm. I mean, yes, yeah. All right, so let me get to the next slides. Uh, let, let me get through the slides uh, in the remaining time and then we can have a discussion. Um, so the question was, does it make sense? Does it make sense? It makes sense, that's great. <laughs> now let's go back to, uh, to last talk by Wolfram. So this is, uh, this is a common pattern in device drivers where you have your physical representation and your logical split into struct devices. So you have uh, any any of like in, in the in the in the in the GPI example, you can have a your platform device that is a GPI controller and it can create several struct devices for each like one one struct device for each bank. Um, so you have that split. And now, what do we do in provider drivers? So a common pattern right now, especially in those sub subsystems that uh, that fail miserably to, to detect a provider being gone, is that you have your struct priv, which represents the private data of the provider driver, like for instance, the GPI controller. You have your struct foo, which is the structure exposed by the subsystem for that for, for the providers to implement. And what you would do is you, you, would, you would typically allocate it and then register it with the subsystem. And the subsystem, what the, the problem that you have now is that the struct device, the logical struct device that is created by your driver or rather by the subsystem for the driver uh, is uh, inside the structure that you just allocated. And this structure will be freed when the provider driver is gone, but you still can have references to that struct device and it will crash miserably. So one, the, the, the this problem is well known. This problem has been around for, for years and different subsystems have different ways of dealing with that. Some uh, just outright explode. Some will uh, have a combination of, for instance, uh, of the subsystem exposing APIs for allocating the structure and then registering it with the subsystem and providers will hand over this allocated data to the subsystem so that it will not be free that driver detached, but it will be controlled by the subsystem and only free when it's safe to do so. Or some subsystem will do completely crazy stuff, uh, block until the last consumer is gone, uh, have special fields in the structure saying that this is a managed structure, so don't free it until, until the last reference is gone. You should okay. never, ever, ever, ever have a KRF inside of something which is in dev mem. I know, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wrote plenty of those bugs myself. Remember that FSI system I, that I wrote and I, I had that bug in it. Eventually, I, I rewrote it to not have that bug in it. We should just dynamically allocate those 
abstract devices on their own with subsystem helpers potentially. A subsystem can be the ones owning the lifetime of them. The, we should never, never statically lay out something with a struct device inside of another structure that has its a different lifetime and yeah, never yeah. put no, them in the You would, you would think so. <laughs> <laughs> it will be slow, but can we have a debug option that detects these things? So when device initialized, for example, I, I, I let Wolfram. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> So not at runtime, but this was exactly my talk in Prague, where I created, I used Coxinel, one Coxinel script checking for like this embedded structure, which generated 400 Coxinel scripts, potential candidates, <laughs> and ran all through them. And uh, then I uh, looked which where the hits were, and I expected it to be worse. There were only 10 hits, but these subsystems were all affected. So I didn't, I, I knew because I'm the I2C maintainer, I knew that I2C was affected. I didn't know that MTD was affected. And while I, I2C tries to, it has this uh, completion, which does not crash, but waits indefinitely, but MTD just explodes. The problem is I, ca I catch this all the time when doing reviews of new subsystems, but it's like the Rusty Russell's guide of APIs. It's really easy to get this wrong. We have nothing to prevent us. If it doesn't have to go through me or somebody, who knows to look for that, it always happens. But that being said, this consumer relationship, I've already changed the driver core to do this for classes and buses and nobody noticed. Hmm. So it can be done. But what, what does it do? It has opaque types that the core of the driver core for a class and a bus logic are now owned by it. And you have okay. handles in the reference. And, and that also allows us to move a ton of stuff into read-only memory. We got a bunch of security benefits out of it. So you get a bunch of whole really good things out of this stuff. I wasn't aware. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, see, it happened and nobody noticed. Yeah, it's yeah. good. <laughs> so that, it's, it proves that it can be done in an incremental fashion. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Do we have, um, you know, the, the Dev M stuff is a whole bunch of different classes of things. Do we have one of them that just says drop a KRF? Do we put, and then we can. No, no, we're triggered on the KRF stuff. Yes, so we so could. Off of it, I, I know it does. Could it be that instead, when we take out the device, we automatically go put a number of things? So if we, if, if, oh, that's all for that. right. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to quickly go through the rest of the slides because I, I only have a couple minutes more left. Um, so, this is what Wolfram suggested during his talk as the preferred solution. So, you have your uh, struct priv. It has a pointer to, uh, and, and now no, note that this doesn't embed the structure for the subsystem. It has a pointer to it. You have your struct foo, which is the, the subsystem structure, and that you should have this. So, you, 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 you allocate yourself the private data for uh, for the for the provider but then you call an api function from the provider to allocate your uh, subsystem specific data which will embed you're not you're not agreeing this is what spy does though right so dev is it here's a problem though yeah. sorry well, I mean, Spy. I, I think it's Spy returns you a pointer that con to, to your private, like you, you give him, you give it the size of your private data, and exactly. it, yeah. You so, give it, you give but it's the, 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 it's pretty much it's, it's the same logic, right? It's it's you, you make the Spy subsystem or the the your abstract subsystem allocate memory for you, no, and it's, it, it's, sorry, it's a bit different because in in this picture, the driver allocates the private structure. Yes. While uh, in the SPI solution, where you say this is my device and I need that amount of memory as an integer um, you get a pointer to that memory you can use but you're not responsible to you're, you're not owning it in that way that you need to free it yes but and, and anyway the the, the yeah it's, it's it's just about not uh, referencing any reference counted uh, resources from your private data and uh, however you achieve it uh, I, okay let, let's say that this is uh, someone's preferred solution <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, let's, let's 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 not let's not uh, see the let's, let's stop see the the, the Wolfram, Wolfram's name what well, one other issue with this is also you can't use the container up trick which is really ubiquitous in the kernel is if you have a struct dev you can't get your private data from it very yeah easily, yeah which you can argue whether that's a good uh, way of doing are, things, but it's, it's pretty common, right? Well, no, yeah. Really, I mean, with we with Spectrum Meltdown killed function pointers, so following a single pointer is okay, but when we start putting function pointers out there, we got to be very careful. Right, right. 
but so, container hub is at build time. Anyway, something like the, the, the like this slide is is, is uh, <laughs> something close to that is is Volcom Square Solution. <laughs> but uh, what I will say is that this is uh, this whole approach. It's a whole family of different uh, of different ways of achieving that. But this, to me, bra it, it it's not necessarily wrong technically if it works, but it breaks the logic because you should keep your var you should keep your resources within the scope so that if a driver allocates something, then it should, it, if it allocates it at probe time, you should free it at remove time. If it allocates it with DevM, then it should be freed uh, after remove. If you do get, you should do put. If you do alloc, you should do free and not do alloc and then expect someone else to do that. This is my issue with this solu with, the, with this approach. So I, I was thinking that this, the, the the wrapper approach that I presented previously is actually capable of fixing two things at the same time or two 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 families of uh, bugs. So let's let's consider this. You have now three structures. So the priv struct priv is the private data of the provider of the resource provider. Struct foo is the data is a, is a structure exposed by the subsystem for you to fill in so that this is where for instance your callbacks will live and you will assign those callbacks and and do whatever and then you have the struct full wrapper which is what i um what what, what i on my previous slide slide it was represented as the as the resource wrapper so this is it it contains struct device and also in this case it contains the rcu protected pointer to the implementation. So um, the struct foo, will, we will call it the implementation. So now what happens is that the driver is free to allocate its own private structure in whatever, however it pleases. So let's say that I'm case alloc, then it assigns the, the, in, the implementation structure. It's not different from regmap config or nvmem config where you assign a set of fields, then pass it over to the subsystem, the subsystem picks whatever it needs from that config and whatever happens later to that config is irrelevant because the subsystem already copied all the data that it needs. And now you register that resource with the subsystem and it is responsible for creating that wrapper and for managing its lifetime. Does this make sense as well? I'm sorry, what? The operation. The function pointers that you have there are not the, the foo ops. They can't be const. The, the they're not what? They constant. Like they, you don't have a. Constant yeah, yeah, but it's it's it's, it's, it's yeah. just. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's just it's, it's just yeah, a model. No, it's it's uh, it's it's not it's not it's a it's pseudocode. Yep. Okay, so now if this makes sense, well, if it doesn't make sense, then then uh, thank you for my <laughs> for attending my talk. But I I hope it does. So the thing is that. <sighs> We don't, every subsystem does its own thing. And right now we, I'm working towards making GPIO compliant with what I presented to, to be the first good citizen in the kernel. But we have so many subsystems, they are not centralized. So I was thinking, what if we um, abstracted a set of those operations? So if we created an abstraction for that wrapper, an abstraction for that implementation, uh, put the code that actually does the SRCU, the critical sections, inside some kind of a library, and yeah, Keep going. yeah, and and, and, <laughs> and simply and simply create a library that providers will be able to use, and this could look like like this. So whenever you do GPIO get or regulator get, you first enter your entry point will be this let's say resource manager abstraction, which will deal with entering the critical section and doing whatever lookup you need. And, uh, and, and then you can, okay, um, I admit that I'm, I'm, I, I made this up, but uh, maybe this is a starting point for a discussion on how to, how, to, uh, how to do it, how to start converting subsystems into doing a unified thing and yes. 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 I agree. Because, because uh, so this is why we created the driver model. Because we, we had to have a unified way to do this stuff. We wanted to make it easy for everybody. It's grown and gotten messy and it's harder. But yes, because we don't want buses and every subsystem to have to do the same thing and us audit the whole thing. And I mean, is it, no, Andrew's not here, but I mean, he was always mad at KREF 
because every, we can write, everybody can write a reference count, but the goal is you have a library. If you use the library, you know when you're reviewing code as a maintainer, it's right. Mm -hmm. So that's the goal. We can, we can handle a little bit of abstraction in order for correctness. So that's, that, I agree. Yeah, we, we should try. <laughs> One suggestion on the way forward, I don't know, I've done my share of driver and subsistence in the past, but uh, try looking hard at what it would look like in two vastly different subsystems yeah, sure. to make sure that your uh, library of abstraction covers, mm -hmm. you no, know, that doesn't end up in a direction that fundamentally won't work for something well, just, the I mean, other. That's how we do it for driver core. We did three, and when we had yeah, yeah. the third one, all helpful. <laughs> and I, I, as much as it pains me to say that, uh, all those little wrapper functions would lend themselves beautifully to a macro that generate them automatically. Uh, yeah. That's just to avoid typos, basically. I mean, yeah. I mean, like, look at an easy one like USB. <laughs> <laughs> like a, a simple one like USB or PCI where the model's easy, and then I2C where it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, that's what that's what threw us off, and then the SPIO and GPIO. I mean, once you get those pick three, those three or something, then I think that's a good proof of concept that we can do this, and then go from there. Yeah, and in platform, of course, platform works. I think one is good for proof of concept. Three is good for generality. Yeah. Well. Yeah. One. Yeah. Exactly. And that's how we we rolled. I mean, in the two six days, we rolled this across subsystem at a time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't require you to force everybody to do it once. We can do it this way too. Yeah. yeah so uh, this was my talk, and uh... oh, and video for Linux, V for L, those guys. Oh yeah. yeah. I, I mean, that's if you can do media. Yeah. For the real problem. So, so it, uh, I admit that this this abstraction library, it uh, it's it's a romantic idea, but uh, I, I I expect it to to take a long time and. Uh, well, let's try it. I mean, you said you're doing something like this for GPIO already. What, what I'm doing is I'm I'm making GPIO use this approach. So I'm on this this release cycle. I, I think I I hope to introduce the SRCU protection for that uh, for that implementation pointer, and uh, yeah, some 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 well, more I fixes. Mean, implement it there and see if it works, and then we can abstract it back out to the common pieces out and. The, the the problem with GPIO is that, um, and I expect that many subsystems have this problem that uh, there is so much craft and so much abusers of the API. So yeah. in GPIO, lots of lots of drivers, and I've been fixing them for the, for the last three months. Lots of drivers all over the kernel just uh, include the private header, yeah. the the, yeah. the the one that lives in, in drivers slash GPIO, and just the reference the private structures because yeah. it's convenient. So well, I mean that we did that when I changed the bus and driver class card. We did that, and I had to touch everybody's subsystem. Yeah. And fix that up. It's just yeah. We'll just, just we can change everything. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just code. Yeah. And Cockenell can script it too. <laughs> so, yeah. But no. Yeah. Let's let's try. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. No I'm problem. Serious. <laughs> it's Thank you, Linaro, for uh, for for paying me to do that. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's been long needed. I should tell him probably. When you convert the IRQ subsystem, you know you have done, really done it. <laughs> yeah, I'll note this problem actually goes all the way up to file systems because when someone pulls out a USB stick, file system has no idea that you know the block device has disappeared, and then you know the part device disappeared. Everything goes away, and then we you know end up spewing huge amounts of stuff as opposed to saying, "Oh, it's gone. Let's just try to clean up easily." Um, so yeah, I, this is a problem that is all over the kernel um, <clears throat> because once you deal with file systems, now you have to think about file descriptors, right? What do you do with an open file descriptor to a file that is on a file system where the block device has disappeared. Um, so it will take a while to get this all right, um, but I look forward to that glorious day. <laughs> we, have it, we have it done in almost every system. And every subsystem in a badly, yeah. in a different way. I mean, you hit all the file systems to make it work and yeah. it took three years. I mean, 
it'll get there. But we have it, so it's just going to be cleaning up the existing implementation, fixing all the drivers that have been abusing it, and then just going and rolling it forward. So it's there in pieces. But yeah. And then you can finally put a GPIO on a USB device, right? <laughs> you did a nice job defining the problem. Thank you. Yeah. Did you think about adding K unit tests for the subsystems to exercise this uh, problem and then fix? I mean, you know, it's like a test driven development, right? You fix it, then you are done when the test passes. Well, the, K unit. Uh, depends on, yeah. Uh, no, <laughs> but, but you're right. So what I'm currently working on is like a, a test suite, which is especially for these object lifetime issues. Um, so we, we can still track what's going wrong and uh, if we already are working on it. The problem is I, it's not so easy to put to existing test suites because most of the tests will either block indefinitely or crash the kernel real bad. So most self-tests rule that out because then you don't have, they don't have a test process anymore. Um, but still, I think these problems went under the radar for too long. So I, that's why I'm working with this test suite, uh, putting up a website and saying, okay, these are the problems we identified. And since Bartosz and I was playing this ping pong, we all, whenever we meet it, whenever we meet the first sentence is, oh, it's actually worse. <laughs> <laughs> so I expect a lot more, a lot more tests to come, but then at least they're documented and we can start working on them. Test for the driver core to, to document some undocumented behavior of how it works. <laughs> so yes. The, uh, one, one more thing is that uh, until recently, uh, it's at least with GPIO, it was possible for user space to just crush the kernel using that problem because uh, so 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 I, I I fixed it or I papered over it. So right now it doesn't happen at least from user space. You can still crush it from with a USB stick, but at least user space a user space process cannot come and and, and crush the kernel. But uh, yeah, it's a, it is a problem. Have you, you you talked a lot about when the device disappears, but like in the case, some of the you in plugging a USB stick is one thing, but some of the reasons a device disappears because it's actually in a low power state. But so what about when the device comes back? You is it is there is there anything a, a device that is in low power state is removed? Yeah. No, I mean like or or the take your USB case when the device is plugged back in. Is there is there like you talked about the teardown process? What about the coming back? Pro is there anything well, it's, it's, it's we need to be thinking about device. for you the coming back it's process? A, it, 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 how how is replugging the same USB stick different from the first time you plug it in? Well, that's what I'm wondering. I'm, I want to make sure like the, we're coming back. Is this we're not going to have any similar issues yeah. coming back up? Okay. But, but in in some embedded devices when things hit low power state they actually like it's equivalent to disappearing right like the and driver we, we, we is had, detached had, hmm? that's true yeah but that's that's true the yeah, driver yeah. is still there yeah yeah okay okay yeah i'm, I'm thinking confused mixing up the driver and the device yeah but what just Bjorn told me today is that uh it can happen that you use uh remote proc instance and then this other processor has a watchdog saying okay i failed and what you usually try to do then is to unbind reset everything clock some power and bind again so then you're exactly at this problem and i agree it's a totally different problem set and So um, the the original implementation of that would expect that the highest level drive the functional drivers would uh, sort of recover their state in that new uh, new spawn representation. But after looking at all the quirks that that came with, uh, I ripped all of that out when I upstreamed the solution. So so it's really when when your DSP goes down, we we it's the equivalent to pulling the USB plug, and then we reconnect it. Uh, there is. Uh, there's various cases in there where we have problems with, for example, uh, lingering debug FS nodes from the from the dying side. 
which then conflicts with when we recreate devices because of this. So, so there is more work to do there, but, but it should be equivalent to just unplug, disconnect everything, and then it comes up again. And then user space has to handle that. The problem here is that the, the remote proc is also a provider of resources. So some other drivers are consumers of something which disappears. And even if you handle this, that nothing blows up, right? These other devices, they don't have the provider and they cannot replug. We don't have a callback to rebind. There's a, there's a debugging option that like unbind every driver driver after you bind it or de detach after you probe it for you know testing the, the unbind path. Is there something that like we could do here to make sure like if I'm running on some platform, make sure all the drivers are don't have this sort of problem? Remember, drivers are not drivers binded to devices, but that doesn't expose how they reference like to file systems or anything else. So you, it's going to be device type specific tests, unfortunately. And everybody remembers bind and unbind with the debugging only. But why? <laughs> <laughs> that was debugging API only, and now everybody uses it in production. Greg, <laughs> I have a question. What? How did the sysfs unbind attribute come to be? Because this is something. I, I was debugging. I was just debugging. <laughs> Seriously, I wrote a it, it, was, it was it was just to debug, and I was like, oh, let's, let's write this and see it. And I, I wrote a Linux Weekly news article saying, hey, look at this cool thing. We can we can test our code easier, and now that's how the cloud runs. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this this the Sisyphus attribute is uh, in such an easy way to crash all kinds of things, and I was wondering, like, yeah. if we're making it available, then it should work right, but it doesn't, and uh, it's not your fault, of course. It's no, it's just I mean, uh, well, someone else's fault. It's a great but... debugging tool, right? <laughs> so yeah, right. ending source of sysfox reports, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. If I go through the separate bind attribute, so that's the way to the bind. Yeah, but not many. Yeah, I know, but not not Just many drivers use it. Sprinkle everywhere, suppress bind, and uh, <laughs> problem solved. So you, Wolfram, you said you had a coconut script to help detect some of these things. Is this something that is easy for other people to reproduce and sort of see like where the issues are or where you think they are? Because I have the feeling that this lifetime object lifetime thing. Doug Anderson made the comment about uh, container of right, and I've seen that in so many of the drivers that I've worked on. So the lifetime of the objects really worries me right now because we're using dynamic um, objects, right? So as a note, we're actually a little bit over. Yeah. So okay. Uh, uh, maybe we can take one or two, and then we should probably uh, have the API go. <laughs> I think detect, uh, for detecting these issues, Cox Chanel is a good good thing because I only did this embedded struct device. I all made that clear in my talk, but there's also like CDEF device interactions which are problematic, and I think Cox Chanel in general is a good Good tool to point the finger to potential problem uh, problematic candidates. Yeah. Yeah, I think the conversation has started to fracture, and this could go on all night. Um, but yeah, let's thank the presenter. <laughs>